Yes, welcome back uh, from uh, the short break. Uh, I hope uh, all of us had a small coffee tea. This is the final session of our scientific paper. It will be moderated by Dr. Christine Anscombe and uh, Dr. Dietrich Beckmeyer. Just to say a few words, as you, most of you know them very well, they have very wide CV bio. I will mention a few of them. Dr. Christine Anscombe was her PhD from the University of Northampton, UK. She is Assistant Director Marketing at Satra Technology. We know that her role in the IULTCS uh, Secretariat Committee, uh, really in the organization of this Congress also, she played great, great role. She helped us a lot. Uh, she has uh, long years of experience uh, previously. She, she was, she, I think now also director and co-founder of LaserWise Limited, uh, innovation and the tanning manager at BLC Laser Technology as previous experience, production manager at Packer Laser. She served as director and general manager at Car Tanning. These are few that which I can mention. Dr. Dietrich Tekmer. He was president before of this uh, IULTCS. He's global head now of business development and industry relations at TFL and uh, Dr. Dietrich really, he other than supporting us from distance traveled all the way to come to this uh, main hall he's with us. Uh, we are not uh, really taking this, this as a uh, just uh, simple, we are very appreciative and uh, we would like to present our gratitude for all the support also TFL made to this Congress. It was a gold uh, sponsor and we acknowledge that too, uh, always. Therefore, without uh, taking much of your time, our esteemed moderators, uh, uh, let me uh, give you the floor. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Mikonen. Um, yeah, as already mentioned, we are now in session number nine, the final session. Um, the end of the marathon, how you called it in the beginning. Uh, um, so we are in the stadium round right now. We still have five interesting presentations ahead of us. They are coming, uh, covering a broad range of, of topics. Iocytes is the first one and about enzymes. It's the second one, um, then about SME adoption. I think that is small, medium enterprise adoption, the technology, <coughs> excuse me, the 3D visualization, and finally uh, a presentation about leather smell. And we have two presentations, even from Africa, which I really appreciate very much. Um, we have um, made the arrangement. Christine will introduce the speakers. So I will pass on the floor to her. Thank you, Dietrich. Can everybody hear okay? Yeah, well, good morning, everybody. And I'm, I'm really delighted that the Congress is going so well. Um, I've been joining from the UK every day. And um, yeah, I think it's been a great success. So this, this final session, I'm sure, will be just successful. Um, can I introduce our first presenter? It's Ms. Xu Xiaoyu from... Um, from China. She's a first year graduate student at the School of Light Industry, Science and Engineering in Shangxi University of Science and Technology. Her major study area is biomass chemistry and material engineering. And the title of her presentation is going to be Green Antimicrobial Bio-Based Nanocomposite Hydrogel for Leather Finishes. So I'm sure this is going to be a very interesting um, presentation. So do we have um, Ms. Xu? Is she available? I'm not sure if it's a recording or if she's there in person. 
I think say I, 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 I think she's a remote delegate. I could see her on the list, but I um haven't haven't seen her yet. Ah, she is just joining us. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Today uh, I feel very honored to be here and give you this presentation. The title of my presentation is Green Antimicrobial Bell Based Nanocomposite Hydrogels for Nano Finishes. My name is Jin Xi. I come from Shaanxi University of Science and Technology. I'd like to elaborate my content from the following parts. The first one is something about the research background. As we all know, the nano finishing can be one of the most crucial processes during nano making. And for the nano finishing agent, it can protect the surface of the and its products, and also to give the beauty and a good handle filling, and also increases the added value of the products. So it is very important. Among all the data finishing agents, the environmental friendly ones, including the protein-based data finishing has attracted great attention due to its good biodegradability and performance, such as casing. Casing film has strong adhesive force and good moisture permeability and so on. However, due to the substantial polar groups in its structure, casing films is hard and brittle and cannot resist the water molecules. What's more, it is easy to be milled away. That means it cannot uh, cannot stand against the bacteria. So in order to solve these problems, researchers always use some other kind of polymers or some additives to increase the uh, flexibility or softness of casing films. In our previous study, since 2010, we have tried to uh, successfully employ some inorganic nanoparticles into casing matrix. That means by regulating the morphology in the structure, uh, we have introduced the silica, the oxide, titanium ox the oxide, and so on to give good functionality of the composite finishing agent. For example, if we introduce the oxide nanoparticles into casing matrix and to prepare cold shell structure, the antimicrobial uh, finishing agent can be obtained. In order to further extend the application value and and value of this kind of nanocomposite, we focused on this kind of materials, that is hydrogels. We, I believe that all of you are very familiar with this kind of hydrogels, and uh, it has superior hydrophilicity and water holding capacity and swelling property. So it is widely used in so many fields, including biomedical and uh, construction and uh, coatings. As far as as for hydrogen coatings, there are some examples. So by using its delivery behaviors and lubricity, we can find that hydrogen has a good potential use in coating. But up to now, 
there few uh there are few researches about hydrogen based nanofinishing agents. Based on our previous study and inspired by the current research progress, our research ideas lies in that we combine casing matrix with nanoparticles together. Here, zinc nanoparticles can be used not only as the antibacterial agent but also as the cross linker in the 3D network structure. We optimized some parameters and to get the optimal structure and the performances. The second part is materials and methods. The methods are called semi-dissolved soldier acidification methods. Here are some, here are some uh, uh, the illustration of this process. We can find that by adjusting the parameters and the acidification condition, we can go to the uniform network. Let's move on to the results and discussion. From the FTIR and SEM results, we I can conclude that a three-dimensional network can be obtained by adjusting the pores and thickness of the wall and etc. And we found that the hydrogen has good elastic behaviors and tough resistance. From the EDS results, we know that zinc oxide nanoparticles were uniformly disformed in the hydrogen, which can be beneficial to the mechanical properties and swelling behaviors. Interesting, we found interesting we found that this kind of hydrogens can be strongly adhesive to different substrates, including the skin, the glass, the wood, and the plastic and so on, which can extend the uh, application fields. And from the mechanical properties results, we know that the, the stretchness of the hydrogen can be enlarged more than two times, which is expected. We apply this kind of hydrogen in uh, on data surface, from the results, we know that it can give data good antibacterial effects and improved moisture permeability. What's more, it can also be used in data affluent treatment since it has an obvious dye absorption rate. So I think in our further studies or future studies, we may be focused on to deeply dig some relationship among the um, structure and performance and the application performance. That's all about our results and the discussion. And finally, I'd like to sincerely thank all the team members in our research group and that is all that is the four authors for this paper, including my supervisor Jian Zhongma and my uh, two of my students, Yu Xi Yang and Xiao Yu Xu. And uh, also thanks for the National Natural Science Foundation of China. That's all, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Xiao. I think that's that a really interesting presentation, and I'm sure it will generate some questions at the end. So, can we just ask you to stay? Make sure you stay online, and at the end of this session, um, we'll come back with all the questions that we have. Thank you. Um, can I take us on to the um, the second presentation? Um, have we got Mr. Viniam Abdissa available? Um, Mr. Abdissa is um, from Ethiopia and he's a holder of an MSc degree 
in leather technology and is currently working at the Leather Industry Development Institute in Ethiopia. Um, Liddy, if those of you know as Liddy. And today the, the topic is going to be on um, studies on optimization of amylase extraction using fabricated extraction column for fiber opening. So have we got, um, is, again, is it pre-recorded or do we have Mr. Abdissa with oh, us? Auditorium, he's standing up on stage. Oh, good, he's there. <laughs> you, got him, you got him in person, that's nice. <laughs> good. Is he, is he coming to the microphone? Okay, thank you. It's an honor to present in my work in this uh, prestigious global event. Here we are going to see uh, how the experimental method of enzyme extraction is much efficient than the Coleman, the uh, conventional method of uh, enzyme extraction. Not only the usage of agroindustrial waste, but also a simple technique, high volumetric productivity and better product recovery makes a solid state fermentation an attractive alternative method. We use a wheat bran as a solid substrate due to its richness in starch and also the cost and availability makes it ideal to cultivate a microorganism known as Bacillus subtilis. This study aims to design and develop a method to maximize and optimize the enzyme uh, extraction process as by using a special design column. For this study, uh, for this work, we use uh, the substrate was subjected to a, a, a biological decomposition by use of uh, inoculum. First, a flask level uh, production was carried out, then followed by a tray level production. And finally, the enzyme was extracted by using the conventional method, which, uh, which involves mixing the uh, biomass with appropriate, appropriate buffer and followed by filtration and centrifugation to get the supernatant, what we call it the crude enzyme. After extraction a process, the activity, was, the activity of the enzyme was analyzed based on the standard DNSA method for both a flask level and tray level production. The characterization of enzyme was carried out uh, by studying the effect of both pH and temperature on the enzyme uh, activity. Based on the result, at a, temp at a pH of 7.1 and at a temperature of 30 degrees Celsius, we are able to get an optimum enzyme activity. Based on the dimension of a one liter measuring cylinder, we design our column made of glass. It has a total height of 85 centimeter and a diameter of seven centimeter. It is also equipped with a mesh having a pore size of uh, 0.3 millimeter. This uh, column will be packed with various set of fermented wheat bra and uh, we, the extracting buffer is allowed to pass through the column at the uh, top port, and the crude enzyme would be extracted uh, or collected at the uh, bottom port. From here on, we are going to use uh, this extraction method rather than the conventional method, and various parameters like particle size of uh, wheat bran, the packing, uh, the head of uh, packing bed, and also the Flow rate of the, ex, uh, the extracting buffer solution will all be optimized at one time approach. The substrate is subject to a sieving operation uh, having a mesh of 1.4 millimeter. Any particles that pass through it are known to be a fine particle, whereas the retained uh, outermost layer known to be a coarse particle. And the middle layer is known to be a medium sized uh, particle. And according to the result, at a 72 hours of incubation period, uh, the medium sized particle shows a better uh, activity than uh, the rest of sample. Various extracting buffer solution flow rates are optimized at a constant flow rate. Here, one, uh, in order to, uh, in order to uh, study their, act, uh, their activity on the, uh, in order to study their activity at constant, uh, uh, at a constant, uh, at here, uh, one liter of uh, buffer solution, in our case water, is allowed to pass through the column at a range of uh, 50 milliliter per minute up to 150 milliliter per minute. Finally, they learn to be collected at different fractions and, 
in addition to this fractional uh, comparison, we, cal we calculate the combined activity. We summarize uh, each of uh, the fractions at their respective flow rates. Here, the combined activity for 100 milliliters per minute shows a better activity than the rest of the sample. The column will be packed with various heights of fermented wheat bran, ranging from 100 gram to 400 gram of fermented wheat bran. The combined activity for 200 gram of fermented wheat bran shows a better result. In comparing a batch versus a continuous column extraction, uh, we should see some uh, basic principle. In case of batch column extraction, the column will be packed with a constant uh, fermented wheat bran and the extracting buffer is allowed to uh, is poured uh, slowly and manually to the column and after 50 minutes of retention time the uh, column the crude enzyme will be collected and analyzed for its activity unlike batch uh, column extraction the continuous column extraction involves a continuous flow rate of uh, buffer and according to the result the, the combined activity for the continuous column extraction shows a five-fold higher than uh, that of a batch column extraction. The working principle of single column extraction is obvious, but in case of uh, the dual column or double column extraction, it involves uh, two columns having same size and design for extraction process. It is in such a way that the buffer is paid to the first column continuously, and the output of the first column is used as an input or extracting agent to the uh, second column. And finally, the eluent will be collected and analyzed for its activity. Please note that the total bed volume used for single and dual column, uh, dual column extraction is kept constant. For this study, we uh, use uh, various uh, bed volume ranging from 100 to 300 gram. In all uh, the result, not only the fractional activity, but also the combined activity shows a uh, higher result in case of dual column. The residual activity, which uh, represent the activity of the, the activity of the enzyme in the residual biomass, hence the, the conventional method shows a higher residual activity than uh, the uh, experimental method of enzyme extraction. Finally, uh, correlating the total yield for uh, for all type of extraction system that we carried out so far, namely conventional batch column extraction, single column extraction, and double column continuous column extraction. From all uh, the extraction type, the continuous column extraction shows a 75% higher yield than the rest of extraction type. Finally, the enzyme which shows the highest, highest activity was taken for the application purpose. Uh, the skin was treated with the enzyme uh, ranging enzyme concentration ranging uh, two to five percent and various tests was carried out like protoglycan release physical strings characteristics of the cross laser and also fiber opening for uh, by uh, all from all this result the five percent treated skin shows a better uh, result than the rest of the sample for uh, finally on conclude by saying that uh, for a specific design of the column uh, parameters like uh, particle size, flow rate, and height of uh, packing bed volume, and also the arrangement of uh, extracting column plays a major role in order uh, to get an optimum amylase activity. Finally, I want to thank uh, Laser Nest Development as well as the Addis Ababa University for their uh, substantial support, and also personally, Dr. Gautam and Dr. Rajita for their encouragement, and thank you for listening. Thank you very much. You're making a quick exit there. <laughs> yeah, that was that was a, a fascinating um, and, and showing uh, such an improvement in the extraction process. So thank you for that. Um, we're now not going to move on to Dr. Douglas Onyancha. Um, Dr. Douglas is from Kenya and is senior lecturer at Deedon Kimathi University of Technology, Nyeri, Kenya. He is the head of School of Science. He heads a number of leather technology programs at the university. In addition, he's been involved in research in leather technology and published a number of journal papers on the same to um, topics. He's also supervised MSc students in leather technology. 
And um, I think we've met over the years, haven't we, Douglas? <laughs> so nice to see you again. Um, the title of the paper is The Study of Determinants of Technology Adoption by the SMEs in Leather Products Manufacturing in Kenya. Can I please pass over to you, Douglas? Thank you, everyone, and welcome to this presentation. And uh, it is entitled Determinants of the Leather Technology Adoption by SMEs in the Leather, Foodware, and Leather Goods Manufacturing in Kenya. And as you have been informed, my name is Dr. Onyancha from Leather and Kimati University of Technology. Um, my presentation is somehow uh, different from the others that have been uh, presented, because you can see in the morning and the other days, they are talking about leather manufacture. Here, we are looking about manufacturing of leather products. Uh, that's footwear and the leather goods. And we are also looking at what's uh, uh, affecting uh, the technology adoption. My introduction will look at uh, uh, the leather manufacturing industry in Kenya. Uh, as we know, leather has, uh, is a very important material. This has been said before, and it has a serious, uh, it's a, a very, very important commodity in the global market. And as such, you will find that the volume of trade is so high. Actually, Kenya has a global share of an estimated market of about 140 million out of 100 billion. And uh, in, the, in Kenya, the leather industry plays a very big role and actually one, uh, uh, it, it contributes about 1.5% uh, to the GDP. And um, there are a number of products which are made uh, ranging from footwear, garments, handbags, and among others. The other thing that we have to notice is that in Kenya, SMEs play a, a, a big role in leather goods manufacturing and footwear. And actually, if you move around the town, you will find that um, around the major towns in Kenya, that's Nairobi, uh, Tika, Nakuru, Kisumu, Mombasa, there are so many SMEs involved in leather goods and uh, footwear manufacturing. And because of their importance to the uh, Kenyan economy, the, the government has tried to support them but they are a few challenges. Many studies have indicated that SMEs who are making, SMEs in broad, whether in leather or in other businesses, they have got a lot of challenges and they are not able to meet global markets, even local markets. If you come to the Kenyan sector, you find that it's a huge market for footwear and for leather goods, but the SMEs who are involved in these activities are not able to tap or to fill the gap. And in that case, um, there is a lot of imports coming in or uh, uh, to fill the gaps. The question is, why are our SMEs not able uh, to uh, feed into the market? And our previous studies, which have been done, they have violated a number of issues ranging from finance, technology, uh, skills, among others. In this study, we decided to figure out technology adoption as one of the challenges and look at it and see what are the salient uh, problems that hinder uh, our SMEs uh, from uh, using appropriate technologies so that they can take advantage of the market. So when we talk about technology, people need to understand that manufacturing, um, uh, technology evolves with time. And of course, metals that were used some years back may not be good at the time. And also they are emerging technologies, which uh, of course, at the end of the day, they make manufacturing more efficient, more profitable. And once you adopt them, you are at an advanced uh, stage or you are at an, an, an added advantage uh, point so that you are able to get into the market at a lower cost, produce very good quality products and meet the market. Of course, when uh, you go around the Kenyan um, uh, market where the SMEs are making their products, you are able to see that, uh, of course, um, the kind of technology they are using, uh, it's not uh, uh, top notch, it is not cutting edge technology. And then we decided now, let us know why are they not able to adopt? And once we have known why, then we are able to prescribe uh, solutions that can um, help them. Of course, technology adoption takes uh, a different, uh, uh, takes a number of steps. For example, there is awareness, there is assessment, there is acceptance, and then uh, learning how to use it. Of course, different people uh, can um, adopt technology at different uh, levels. There are those who adopt it at the onset, 
And those who are actually cannot adopt it at the end of the day, and they still would have to use all technologies. So the methodology that we embraced or we used in this study, uh, we did primary surveys that is uh, going to the uh, manufacturing areas, interviewing these uh, SMEs, collecting data. And then we also did uh, desktop uh, surveys uh, that's uh, to en enable us to know what technologies are present, what is being used. And uh, then we analyzed this data and then we came out with the sun. Of course, as we were going out, there were a number of uh, questions that we wanted to be answered. And the first one was, what are the current technologies that are employed in foodware and leather goods manufacturing by SMEs? Uh, that's a global, uh, globally, not uh, necessarily in Kenya. And then we came, uh, the second question is, what is the state of hard and soft technologies that are adopted by SMEs in Kenya? Of course, we have to know when you talk about hard technologies, these are machines and soft technologies. These are things like enterprise resource management, emails, um, um, and, and such kind of uh, uh, technologies. So, and then we also asked ourselves, what are the factors that are affecting our SMEs in adopting um, the most uh, uh, important or the most advanced technology in their manufacturing? And finally, after we have looked at that, we will give the solution or prescribe or suggest what are the strategies that can be employed uh, uh, in bridging this technological gap. And of course, you have to look at the West, that's the countries like Italy, India, who are already advanced, what, are, what they are doing vis-a-vis uh, -vis what's happening in the Kenyan market. So we first thing we did, uh, we created a questionnaire, we went around, we collected data, and then when we came back to the office, we collected the data, we analyzed. And you can see from this, we got the demographic characteristics of the SMEs. And you can see these businesses are dominated by male, 90%, and followed by female. And most of them are uh, domestically owned, and uh, that's about 96%, and uh, about 4% are owned by uh, foreigners. And then organizational structure, most of them, they are sort of proprietorship, about 95%, and about 3%, um, that's a limited company, cooperative at 1%, and others. When I talk about others, these are NGOs and the likes, which have um, owned those uh, uh, manufacturing enterprises. And then we looked at what kind of products are being made by these SMEs. And you can see at 45%, they were making um, leather footwear only. And actually, that's the most dominant, followed by uh, leather footwear and other uh, leather goods at 35%. And those who are making uh, leather goods only was about 23%. So roughly, that tells you what is happening in the manufacturing sector by these SMEs. And then we looked at also the size of those uh, enterprises. And you'll find that most of them are micro, employing between one and 10 people. And then others are small enterprises uh, uh, or medium, which are employing about 10 to 50 people at 7%. And also we looked at how long these businesses have been existing, because that's very important. Um, less than five years, they're about 16%. Five to 10 years, they're about 35%. Uh, 10 to 15, 21%. And, uh, uh, 15 to 20 years, 14 percent. Over 20 years, those who have been operating um, is about uh, 14 percent. Then we also ask them whether their products are certified and uh, and what type of certification they have. And actually, to our surprise, you notice here about 94 percent they are not certified, and actually they did not know about standards. About six percent they had the CAP certification and none of them had an ISO standard. And of course, this tells you a lot, of course, uh, in the manufacturing sector, if you want to penetrate the international market, you need such a certification, and you have to meet. Sorry? There's some noise in the background. Just continue. OK, um, so. Of course, it tells you if somebody has not certified uh, the product may not enter some markets like the European market, which are very strict in terms of chemical composition, the quality of the product and all that. And if these SMEs, um, uh, for example, uh, are, are, are not aware, then it means their products or products they are going to make, they are not going to meet uh, international requirements. 
And also, of course, if their products are not certified, even the local market, they would be seen as inferior. And uh, again, that one has a serious implication. Now, we also look at the education background of these uh, SMEs because this tells you uh, about the skills they have and uh, uh, whether they are able to uh, do some level of manufacturing at advanced level. Of course, um, you could see from the top, people who had the diploma in leather technology or related courses, 1%. Uh, KC KCP is the lowest level of primary education uh, and the grade two uh, government trade test, there was about uh, 2%. And uh, uh, KCP with grade three, three percent. Trade test alone, uh, uh, sorry for the typo, one percent. Those who had the Kenya certificate of secondary education and on job training, that's two percent. And those who had KCP or CP and on job training was two percent. Short courses, sixty percent, and uh, on job training, five percent. That's meaning they have no another background. Of course, you can see the bulk uh, of the training is uh, or uh, is on job training which is over 80%. And this one impacts seriously on the, on the manpower or the technical skills that are out there. Because if people are trained on job, they, don't, they have not got formal uh, learning. Of course, it means it would impact on the quality or productivity, and even adopting technologies would be a challenge. Um, then uh, we mapped out the the manufacturing stages, and actually here we took the footwear because it has an, a lengthy um, uh, process of manufacturing, and we try to consider what is current and what is on the on the ground. For example, if you talk about the design, um, what is uh, in the in the in the global market, or what is the most current uh, technologies available, and what are the SMEs using? You can see in the in the market or in the global market. There is availability of computer aided design where you can use softwares like Sumaster, 3D printing, and so forth. But uh, uh, most SMEs, they are not closer to that. When it comes to cutting and clicking, uh, that's another process. Of course, you will see they are using knives and scissors and other things instead of using a clicking press or uh, laser cutters. So you can see they are a little bit way far because they cannot compete. Uh, in terms of uh, quantity, because if somebody is using a clicking press, he's able to make huge volumes. If using a laser cutter, they are very accurate. You can program and have minimal waste. Then when it comes to splitting, again, you can see uh, and skiving uh, the kind of technologies that are uh, available and what is being used. And even when you go to assembling, of course, you would find that, uh, of course, when we have advanced stitching machines, like the post bed, the cylinder arms, which can be able to stitch a shoe nicely. Most of them, they are doing flat bed and uh, anti stitching. Of course, they get challenges when they are making their product. Um, you can go down to heating uh, so that when you are conditioning your shoe, what is happening and uh, what kind of uh, uh, what SMEs are using. So, in the, the other one is lasting. Uh, most of the time, they are using hand, uh, hand tools for lasting. While in the, uh, in the market, we do have uh, lasting machines for all the parts of lasting. And in that case, uh, the kind of product that comes out is way superior compared to uh, the one done by hand tools. Um, so that's uh, the, the state of uh, the technology that's on the ground. And uh, if you now look at now how they have adopted hard and soft technologies, when I talk about hard technologies, that's uh, uh, machineries and equipment, about 6% they have um, adopted to some extent, and 94 they are still using rudimentary and old technologies or other kind of technologies. Soft technologies, actually, when I talk about that, even marketing, what how are you marketing? Do you have a website? Do you use emails? Um, do you uh, do planning uh, using softwares? Uh, you can see it is 0%. Um, then we moved forward to look at, because we asked them, what are the factors that are affecting them or influencing them in adopting the technology? Um, I have uh, two columns here, three, col uh, three columns here. One is showing the factors, and the other one is the extent to which it is influencing the adoption. And as you can see, um, one of the factors that is having the greatest impact on soft uh, technology adoption is finance. Uh, followed by 
uh, top management commitment, uh, then followed by human resource, and then followed by competition. Then in ad technology, ad technologies adoption, uh, the greatest influencing factor is the uh, availability of finance, followed by uh, uh, human resource uh, technical availability. And uh, again, uh, the issue of competition, and then the issue of government support. Of course, uh, when you go back to the other slide, you will see that actually the issue of technical skills is an issue because number of people who are working there, they are low level skills. And in that case, you may not expect them uh, to start using advanced uh, machines or advanced technologies. So that's uh, an issue. And then the other issue of finance, which has been uh, said uh, in most studies, and you can also see issue of government support and uh, competition. So looking at all this, uh, we decided now, how are we going to, or what are the possible interventions that can be done? So we looked at each, and then we are looking at uh, how they can be um, the major ones that finance and human technical skills and the government support. So when it comes to finance, of course, this is now goes to policy making. How are the SMEs going to get fina uh, financing? Of course, you realize that sometimes they do not have uh, uh, records so that they can access uh, funds from the banks or getting. Uh, because most of the time you find they get funds from friends, they raise funds as a group and all that, which may not be uh, enough. But again, we can make a recommendation that the government can avail funds that they can borrow at low cost so that they can support their businesses. Or they can get, uh, again, the other thing is that you can show them documentation. This is how you show what you are working on. And when you go to the bank, you can be able to be financed and you are able to capitalize uh, your business. The other issue is technical or human support because uh, you realize most of them uh, get on uh, job training. Again, this issue can be taken up by creating training in, in institutions within the country, which will cater from the lowest level to the highest level. And in that particular case, um, affirmative action can be done. People can be sponsored, go to the training institute, get the knowledge, and then they come to the job market. Of course, this one can be done by the government, and I think our government has already uh, done um, uh, some steps towards that. And actually, as a university, we have also gone into training of human resource. We are training uh, a number of courses so that we can have human resource for the country who can be able now to fit into the market. That's for can be employed, they can be SMEs, and produce goods that can meet global uh, standards or particular market standards so that the, they can also feed the local market with a, a good quality product and they tap into this leather technology sector. The other issue on government support, uh, of course, this is something has been tried in other sectors uh, of, the, of, the, of the economy in Kenya. For example, tax exemption, tax breaks on imported leather uh, uh, machines, uh, on leather inputs. That one can be a huge boost into lowering the cost of uh, manufacturing and also availing some technologies which can be very expensive. So if the government can be able to give tax exemptions uh, to those machinery being imported, uh, they can become affordable. Again, the other uh, a point which the government support as, uh, can come in is uh, pulling uh, manufacturing um, equipment together and creating a center where people can go and use the equipment and pay a small fee because they are not able to buy a machine worth the millions, but if the government buys and places them in a central place, uh, they can use that and they pay a, a little fee. And in that case, they can be able to access technology and they can be able to manufacture very good products. And in that case, they are able also to access market. The, uh, the last one- Excuse me, Douglas, sorry to interrupt you. Just to let, give you a two minute warning. Um, okay. Because we're on quite a, time, a tight time scale. Okay. Thank you. I'm, I'm almost done. This is the last slide. The last one is competition. We know that uh, the, um, the SMEs are faced uh, with a serious competition for importation of secondary products and substandard goods from uh, the countries and also import of uh, leather products, which actually impact negatively. So again, the government can intervene there. I think that's my last slide. And uh, in conclusion, we can say that uh, SMEs are using outdated ad technologies and are yet to upgrade and, impress, uh, and they have not impressed soft technologies. 
finance and technical skills were the major limiting factor among others and the government can play a key role in intervening um, on the two major factors sorry uh, okay fine uh, uh, acknowledgement goes to Comesa LGI for financial support, Dedele uh, Kibati uh, University of Technology for technical support, and the two uh, bodies there which uh, gave us access to SMEs. Thank you so much, and thank you uh, for listening to me. Yeah, th thank you, Douglas. And actually, just um, as you, you mentioned there the important thing of training for the sector. Um, very shortly, there will be some free leather technology training that is going to be made available on the RULTCS website. It's a package that has been put together by um, a very well renowned leather expert and it's really aimed at um, sort of technician leather level in the tanneries. And so um, keep an eye out for that. We'll be, we'll be posting that. Um, I think there's 10 modules that are freely available for anybody anywhere in the world to use. So that will that will be more targeted at the tanneries, but that could be very useful for the Kenyan, um, the Kenyan industry. Uh, that's great that's great yeah we'll so we'll up. keep it we'll keep it we'll send out a, a press release once that's available but it won't be very long now okay <laughs> thank you anyway thank you very much um if i can just move on to our our next presenter now i'm going to have a problem pronouncing the name so i apologize in advance um but I, i'm going to speak to dr nile effen dioglu from from turkey um mr nile dr nile is a phd holder and working as a research assistant at Egi University, Department of Leather Engineering in Turkey. Her research areas encompass leather technology, leather quality tests, leather apparel, 3D simulation, and visualization, sorry, I can't say it, visualization programs. I'm having trouble today with my words. So the topic is an investigation on usability of 3D visualization and simulation programs in leather apparel. So apologize for getting your name wrong and please explain to me how to say it properly. Uh, good afternoon, dear participants. I am Nilay Örk Efendioğlu and my supervisors are Professor Mehmet Metamutlu and Oktay Pamuk. Uh, my topic is uh, an investigation on usability um, of 3D visualization and simulation programs in leather apparel. And I want to proudly say that I am the winner of 2020 IUFCS uh, Arete Young Leather Scientists Grant. Um, and uh, additionally, this project is published by Journal of the Textile Institute. Once a garment is designed, and its patterns are created with CAD systems in a 2D platform, a physical prototype is produced with these parameters in a 3D real world. After critics and regulations on the model, the mass production begins. Conversion of 2D design to a 3D platform and prototype production can be money and consuming. Since companies can now decide whether or not to take a product to market using 3D technology without physical prototype or fever prototypes, the cost of rejecting a style in terms of material, labor, and time is significantly lower. In meetings with leather garment companies in Turkey, we learned this information from them, pattern making for just one model like jacket, uh, is between 30 and $50. When we look at the time, manually pattern making four or five hours, but also CAT system pattern making takes one and a half or two hours. I can say that when a company uses CAT system, it can be faster multiply two and a half times than manually in pattern making. In real life situation, after the pattern making, a sample is seen before starting mass production in leather apparel company. Due to the cost of leather, this sample is seen by using unblanched plain fabric first. If there is any rejection objection from the customer or designer, it is unstitched. If there is an error in the pattern, measurements or sieving, they are prepared and sieve again. After the sample is approved, this time a sample is seen by using leather material. If cost, cost, customer or designer does not approve, the leather material is completely discarded and wherever the mistake is made, that step is corrected and the garment is produced again using new leather material. 
In order to avoid waste time, labor, and money, leather apparel companies can buy 3D simulation program and obtain realistic simulations after applying the test methods mentioned in the study on their own materials. In this way, leather apparel companies can instantly see the pattern errors and uh, the incompatibility between the garment and the material and provide significant saving in terms of both time and cost of the leather. At the same time, it's added to the mentioned saving that sample controls, which are made by the long distance overseas customers visiting to the company, can now be made both quickly and without transportation costs by sending the simulation image to the customer via email. The aim of the project is first to measure the uh, mechanical properties of materials which required from 3D plat program. Second one is to interpret the data and the last one is to compare the simulation on the screen and real garments. Uh, but the main question in here uh, that 3D program is suitable for leather and can leather apparel companies use it? In this project, uh, both garments and leathers, uh, both leathers and fabrics materials were tested with test metals described in Boyd book published by Assist and alternatively with the past method. The material properties were interpreted and data were entered into the program by using Goite book. After the patterns of design dress were created in Assist CAD system 2D, and the dresses have been simulated in Assist Video 3D program by using these standards. Uh, additionally, these dresses were seen by using the same material in real life. Finally, simulation, uh, simulation images and real products were compared by a five-person jury who, who are uh, specialized in this field and the data were interpreted according to Fuzzy logic method. Our materials uh, here table shows the properties of two different types of leather and two types of fabric materials used in the study. Also, we know that fabrics have tighter than the leathers, but first leather DM1 is close to fabric TM2. And it is the same thing on mass per unit area values. The samples were con uh, con here, the samples were conditioned and taken according to official standard test method here. The thickness of materials was measured in task one, compression matter system at two different low, load to and 100 gram per centimeter square. Bending lengths and bending values of the materials were obtained using the pass two bending matter system. By using pass three system, the extensibility and the, of the materials was used under three different loads. In the James Hill drape matter device, photographs of the samples were taken by using a camera. Then the draping views of the samples in the photos were matched between the samples templates in the material entry of the media 3D program. We will see them in the results part. Fabric friction tester device was used to measure the friction coefficient of the materials. The device gave the dynamic friction coefficient of the material surface. The data obtained from different materials by using in the path system are entered in the data entry spaces under the tab headings of the weft, warp, bias, and additional data in the video 3D program considering the quite the published by Asus company. A simulation of the clothes from each material in the video 3D program were created by using the prepared patterns, newly defined leather and fabric materials and 3D manicure. As shown in the figure, the material entry screen consists of four main heads as base attributes, elongation behaviors, bending behaviors, and additional options. All tests and comments results entered in the program under the four main headings mentioned can be seen on the consolidated final screen. Necessary co corrections can be made from the home screen with the four main titles as well as from this final screen. Video 3D simulation program is open and the simulation program starts. The first screen is edit environment. 
Uh, there are different size of virtual mannequins in a 3D video program, but in this step, the dummy to be used in the avatar top is selected, which is 36 size dummy file prepared for this study. Since scene parameters are selected, in next step, scene parameters such as background, light direction, light settings, etc. After all preparations are finished, the start button is pressed, and in the screen we see the avatar and unseen garment, the patterns. After the play button, the garment is seamed and simulation is completed. Uh, the results of mechanical properties of the materials are shown in the table with warp uh, in leather perpendicular to backbone, weft horizontal, and bias direction of leather and fabrics. As expected, TM2, fabric uh, 2, with 5% Lycra, has the highest elongation value. In bending stiffness results, DM2, which tends with chromium and vegetable, has the highest value. This was expected to because of vegetable tanning. In thickness and mass per unit area results, we, same, uh, we see the same uh, situation because of vegetable tanning. In here, fold shape and volume. The photos of the bending folds when the samples are folded and the screenshots of the options of this parameter in 3D video program are shown in figures. We choose the pictures according to samples photos. For example, first uh, leather is similar to this picture and km 2 second fabric is similar to this uh, third picture. Dynamic friction coefficient of the material separated from the up uh, grain of the leather, back of the fabric and flesh side of the leather are shown in table. The purpose of entering the friction coefficient in the 3D video program is that the friction between the mannequin and the garment is determined the fit of the garment. Since the friction between the mannequin and the garment is in question, the friction coefficient values on the back of the fabric and the flesh side of the leathers are selected and entered in the program. Friction coefficient of leathers, leather materials were found around 0.6 and fabric materials were around 0.4. The reason why the friction coefficient of the leathers are higher than the fabric material is a cause of the fiber network on the flesh side of the leathers. The photographs of 3D a dress created in real world on the left and video program on the right side, seen from the all materials are driven from the front, back, left, and right sides in figures. It is seen that the, this is chrom, uh, chromium uh, tanned black garment sheep leather. This is chromium and vegetable brown sheep, sheep leather simulations. And this is first fabric simulations. And this is the second uh, fabric simulations. The foot, uh, it is seen that the armhole, which is one of the problem and called the, especially in the pattern making phase, is simulated harmoniously with the body of the virtual mannequin. The fitting of the cop piece pieces seen in the almost every jacket and dresses um, model in leather garment is important, and the chest cops starting from the armpit have successfully simulated by adapting to the body of the virtual mannequin. Similarly, the cup, cups on the back of the garment ensure that there is no gap and no pot at the waist of the garment. In the waist part, simulated clothes, there is no pot and no gap. As seen in table, where the scores of all materials are given by the juries. When looking at the fabric materials, it is seen that the, they provide good resemblance. DM1, first leather, takes third place in similarity by taking 0.52 points. The simulations created from these three materials are good category. First leather, first fabric, and second fabric is good. Uh, DM2, the second uh, leather with vegetable and chromium tent shows a weaker similarity is in the middle category with 0.47 points. These results can be considered normal since the DM2 has less bending, more weight and thickness, 
and video 3D software is mainly for fabric materials. Table was transferred to the graphs in figure for easy visual evaluation. It is seen that the green bar representing first fabric shows high value compared to the values created by the scores of the materials. And the purple bar representing TM2 has the second highest rating, but on in third place in the criteria of fitting of left side. It is seen that the blue bar representing first leather ranks third in five criteria, while the red bar representing second leather only passes the DM1 scoring in the criteria of fitting right side. Looking at the results in general, it can be said that simulations can be created as real like in 3D video program, but draping on the skirt size does not show reality. As a result of the evaluations of 3D simulations prepared with two different leather and fabric materials by the jury according to criteria determined in accordance with physiologic method, first fabric showed the closest similarity between prepared 3D simulation and dresses. And second fabric was uh, second with a slight difference. It was predictable that the fabric materials would give similarity results. But if the 3D simulations uh, and dress prepared with leather materials were examined, first leather showed close to a good similarity, and second leather showed moderate similarity results. It is seen that the first method is successful in measurement the mechanical properties of leather, but it requires more comments and experience than transferring this data to the 3D video program. Before I say video program is software designed for fabric materials, and this can be explained as the reason why the property of leather metal material is not very successful on just rate parameters. Considering these factors, it's believed that study will make important contribution to the literature and the following studies about the leather material. And it will be a question for leather apparel companies to take one step ahead with cost, time saving, innovative production, and mercantilism by using 3D simulation programs in the top competition of companies. These are my references. And we would like to thank to IUATC IUR Research Commission and a red company to provide me the grant for my project, a university scientific research project coordination office, and Amsterdam University of Applied Science, Amsterdam Fashion Institute for Equipment Support. And you can find the detailed project report in IUATC website from this link. And thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nile. And actually, it's great to see one of our young leather scientists uh, grant winners giving a presentation. And uh, I'd just like to remind everybody who is um, participating that the um, young leather scientist grant for 2022 has been recently launched. And the opportunity is there now is to sub um, submit abstracts. So um, again, if you go to the IULTCS website, you'll be able to find, um, find an opportunity where you can get some funding towards your very important research. So thank you for that. Thank you. Okay, and I think we're just now on to the final presentation in this session, and then we'll all reconvene for some questions. Um, and that's with Dr. Rodolfo Ampuero. Um, Dr. Rodolfo is from Switzerland, is a sales manager um, for the automotive sector at TFL. Um, he has over 36 years experience in leather production, and product development in the chemical industry and he's been involved in the automotive leather sector for the past 20 years so I think you must know an awful lot about automotive leather and the topic of his presentation will be leather smell the impact on Chinese automotive market. Okay thank you very much for the invitation uh, it is an honor to be uh, part of this uh, important audience. And uh, well, the aim of this paper is to bring the awareness of a topic that we as a humans, uh, we never pay much attention, at least before COVID. Now we know that if with COVID we lose uh, uh, some of them, the sense of smell. But of course, uh, this paper is going to be regarded on the impact uh, on the Chinese automotive market 
uh, that is in, in the leather industry bringing uh, big headaches how to solve this problem. So the agenda is going to be uh, very compact. We first, we are going to address the Chinese automotive market uh, complaints and also the Chinese factors that make complaints, a little bit of a short words, so how it works, our sense of smell. Uh, of course, the leather and it the smell behavior. Automotive uh, uh, smell test methods, there are different ones and which volatile uh, compounds are the irritating ones where it develops the problem of the smell in China. And of course, at the end, we try to explain how to avoid smell problems. Well, when it starts the problem in China, we must ask ourselves, uh, okay, we have to say that approximately started in 2010, when the Chinese market uh, automotive production and sales jumped to the 12 million, to the 17 to 24 million. So it was a skyrocketing uh, increase uh, of, of production. We must consider that one third of the automotive market share is related on luxury cars. Most of these uh, cars in that moment was uh, upholstered with leather. Okay, now in 2021, we know that with the cheap prices, it's expected that, okay, the, the production is going to be around about in the 21, 22, uh, like in 2019. Okay, uh, in this chart done by GD Power, uh, is a, 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 a company that makes some research in the automotive industry. Uh, they found that, okay, what was the highest complaint rate in the entire autom automotive industry in China? And of course, it was unpleasant interior smell odor. 10% of each 100 cars were related on unpleasant smell. So this start again with another study. Uh, you see that in 2016, the smell complaints was 16% instead of 10. And of course, over the years, the smell dropped to 10% claims. But if we compare with the column in gray, it was the smell complaints in USA. So why Chinese are so, how to say, uh, sensitive on this? The reason is that Chinese are particularly uh, affected to the external environment to a certain extent the continuous uh, air pollution and news reports of indoor odors have caused Chinese customers to pay more attention to the air quality. What was the factors involved in this? We have must say that there are four factors, two externals and two internals. From the external part, of course, was the Chinese pollution, so the health fear, then the Chinese cultural, cultural difference uh, from smell, and from the internal, I mean what the leather industry has done in, over the years uh, uh, in order to uh, follow the environmental requirements and also to follow the automotive specifications. Let's go for the factors. For factor one, why Chinese are sensitive to others. We have to say that uh, the, due to the extreme high uh, uh, levels of pollution, uh, 50% of the cancer are related on lung cancer. So it, it means that in every minute, four people die from cancer. That is a huge amount. But of course, in the factor number two, the smell is cultural. So Chinese smell different. Uh, just diving a little bit in the biology, uh, our olfactory receptor genes determine how you smell the world and why you smell it different than other people. To some extent, uh, what you taste or smell in your, is in your genes. And the olfactory sense like and dislikes are based on emotional associations through experience. Therefore, the leather smell in China is not culturally associated as pleasant. It's possibly like the leather-like smell is a genetic opinion. If we go to the factor three, so in the leather, leather processing changes, uh, in order to follow the environmental rules, of course, leather industry was pushed to consume less water. 
And what means that, okay, in the beam house process, of course, it was implementing the float recycling, but also in the machine part, uh, many years ago, they came the new drums that they save water, but these drums are in a slow motion. So the rinse and the washing are, let's say, less efficient. At the same time, of course, in order to reduce the carbon uh, footprint, uh, tanneries were pushed also to drop the energy consumption and then become the new methods or the new systems of drying with a low temperature. Low temperature means that the volatiles that still in the leather are not out, still inside. And then the specification in the automobile industry. Of course, in the 90s, uh, since I remember when was a trend that the upholstery leather, normally uh, upholstery leather was lime split uh, with a very soft leather, nice, uh, nice grain, uh, fluffiness, etc. But the switch from upholstery to automotive leathers in order to gain productivity, in order to improve the tightness, uh, the industry switch to, to start uh, going to the full substance tanning, so split it in blue, not in lime. And this makes the process more or less inefficient in the way to degrease. So the degreasing process in the, limes, uh, in the lime split uh, articles are much efficient, much more efficient. You have less fat on the under layer part in the flesh side. And in the full substance, also in order to reach a good pickle values or, or the, the value of the cutting, of the pickle, you need to add or overdose more formic acid or sulfuric acid in order to reach in four hours uh, the, the process uh, uh, accomplished. The last also in the automotive industry, uh, more than 20 years ago, cars are more aerodynamic. The design uh, are that made that the winds, windshield, windscreen uh, are more, let's say, uh, but that the lights of the sun goes perpendicular to the windscreen and then the car interior heats up much faster and at higher temperature. What happened is that, okay, uh, if the leather inside, if the car was upholstered with leather inside, uh, OEMs start pushing the tunnels to bring the leather more heat resistance. And then it was pushed to move from natural tanning agents to oil or natural oils to synthetic alternatives. This also changed the leather smell. So the four factors I explained will be difficult to change. In other words, the leather smell problem arrived to stay. So it's not good news, but somehow uh, at the end, I think that we will find a way how to solve this problem. A little bit of the sense of smell, just to bring you a awareness, every day we breathe more than 23,000 times and we circulate approximately 12 cubic meters per day. So I must say that the smell target one of the sense that you literally cannot ignore because you cannot start stop breathing. Hmm? How many uh, scents people can recognize? Okay, from the fragrance industry, they say there's 2,000 different scents we can recognize, but most of them are related to the good odors. From the bad odors or the unknown odors could be even hundreds of thousands or even millions of substances. Okay, the leather smell. What is the leather smell behavior? The leather smell is a mixture of many individual components similar to perfume. The leather smell develops slowly after production. The leather smell lasts long. The leather smell change over time. The leather smell are influenced by humidity. In other words, we also said many times that the leather breathes. In this case, release volatiles, but also absorb volatiles. What are the sources of bad smell? Well, there are many natural fats and fat liquors, bioxidations of fats and oils, aldehydes, degradation products like amines, fatty acids, degradation caused by microorganisms, protein degradation, biocides, sulfur compounds from bean mouse. I must say that sulfur is one of the stinkiest molecules in the world. 
So, and we use it and, and luckily uh, in the leather industry as well. Also, of course, retaining agents have a big impact in dye stars. So one hint, you must choose your chemicals during the whole leather making process is very cautious. Only one bad candidate, even a dye can downgrade the odor tremendously. Okay, a little bit about smell evaluation. You, some of you, you know that, but many of the audience maybe not. You see this picture, there are some people there smelling in a, a glass uh, bottle. Normally the smell test, they put a specimen inside, they heat it up over a time and a certain temperature. And then uh, a trained panel jury, they put the nose and mostly they measure the intensity. In some cases also the connotations or the hedonic tone they call. Here as an example, Volkswagen, they have a smell description of, let's say all interior components that are used in the car. Uh, talking with uh, Dr. Tassler, uh, he told me that in the car interior, there are more than a thousand components and each component is tested single piece and has to pass through the smell test. But all of these thousand components, you can see all these names <laughs> to identify. So how you can name the smells that is, uh, you need a very well-trained people in order to detect and to qualify in this. For us will be very easy in the yellow ones to detect it, asparagus smell, cheese smell, coconut smell, fishy, honey, peppermint. But just tell me the red ones, dull choking, lips biting, scrapping throat, tongue burning. But okay, leather is there also as well. They have two types of smell. They call it leather fecal, so like rancid or putrid, or leather-like. What is the leather-like smell? As we uh, learned in the, in a, many years ago, the Connolly leather smell was made done with veg tanning and nice, good fish oil. To complicate more the, 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 the smell evaluation, each OEM has different test methods. VDA 270 is the, the German method that is for the uh, automotive German uh, concerns. And you grade the smell one to six uh, from non-perceptible to non-acceptable. Fourth, they rate it one to five. Test back method, one to 10. Then GM also one to 10. But the most complicated to perform is the Toyota test. Toyota test, not only they measure the intensity, but also you have to measure also with a scale one to five or one to three, sorry, which type of smell, like sour smell, sweet smell, burn smell, if it is one intensity or the two intensity or the three intensity. None of these methods correlate each other. So if you have a piece of leather that passes of the German test method, doesn't mean that the Toyota test method will pass as well. So that makes really complicated the, 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 the way how to go through. Which are the compounds more irritating in car interiors? You will see here the different components that are selected from low to high odor th threshold means that the lower the threshold, the component is the most, let's say, problematic or the most uh, uh, um, smelly. We have to check here amines. Amines are used in the beamhouse with such dimethylamine or mercaptor compounds that or dye stuff that they have a pungent and fishy garbage odor. We have also ester compounds such as butyl acetate used in finishing with an ether like um, odor making people feel dizzy, aldehydes, benzene, ketone, alcohols, naphthenic, alkyl, all of these components, most of them are detected in the test emissions in leather. Doesn't mean that these components are 100% becomes from leather come also for the car interiors. But nevertheless, all these components also in the leather emissions test are uh, detected. So how can we solve the problem? Of course, we need to identify off all those by analytic methods, identify the sources in the leather processing, 
and choose the right chemistry and processes uh, in leather production. We need to work together, all work together to tackle the problem because it's not solved yet. Thanks uh, for your attention. Thank you very much, Rodolfo. Um, that was very interesting. Actually, one of the reasons I joined the leather industry when I was a teenager was because I liked the smell of leather. And I was quoted <laughs> that on B BBC Radio 4 <laughs> when they asked me as a student, why did you join? So it's interesting how everybody perceives the smell in a different way. And, it, and obviously to the point when it is actually a commercial problem. Oh, yes. <laughs> like, thank you for that. Yeah. Right, Dietrich, I'm going to pass back to you because I think now we're going to bring everybody together and um, have the question and answer session. So would all our presenters like to join us? And hopefully we've got lots of questions. Yes, okay. I will do. Thanks, Christine. Um, looking to the IT department. If you can maybe put up the question, which are there. Now, the first question <coughs> goes to Livia. Thank you for the presentation. In addition to the... In, the, in addition to the intrinsic, who, what do we do? Oh, okay, then, excuse me. Um, the first question goes to um, Rodolfo. Thank you very much for your work and presentation. What are the most effective ways to solve the smell of leather at present? Mm -hmm. So I guess it's the one hour presentation again. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, but maybe you can, can say a few words. Uh, can I talk? Can you hear me? Yes? Yeah. Yeah, we can okay. hear you very well. Okay, thank you. No, well, uh, we know how to solve the problem, but all these problems are against the environmental rules. Let's say, I would say, wash as much, wash as, much as possible, uh, dry, uh, at higher temperature your leather as possible so you can release the volatiles. But definitely you, or you have to avoid water recycling uh, because it's like you are washing your clothes with dirty washes, you know? So you, somehow you are including some of this uh, pollution or, 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 or substance in that recycled water inside into the leather. And, uh, and you have to choose definitely uh, each product you have to test it in, in leather sing, in single in single additions and run smell test. And uh, but of course I cannot change the way how Chinese smell. That is cultural. So that is inherent in the in the in the uh, how to say in the brains in the genes of the Chinese people. And there is let's say it's not not easy on the processing. Are these the the, the the hints that I can tell you? If you can do that. I think that you will uh, have a, 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 a less smell in your material, definitely. Yeah, thank you. And again, it's the smell is a result of many, many, many different components. And if you change a few one, the smell is not away, it's just changed. Yeah, that's what we also learned. Mm -hmm. So another question do we have? Again, for you, Rodolfo, mm -hmm. nice presentation. According to your work, two people can smell one item differently. Is it good or bad? Do you think this also is working for um, hydrogen sulfide smell? <laughs> well, a good question, good question. Uh, reading many books, uh, the US Army, they were looking for the stinky bomb that every culture, every habitant in the world could reject this smell. And it was not possible. So there are some cultures that also stinky smell, like maybe sulfur, people like it because you can associate it for something pleasant. In the other way, uh, a, a lady, a young lady, died her mother when she was six years old and she was in the funeral. And when she was saying bye to bye bye to her mother, the funeral was plenty of roses. 
And the lady now is 50, 56. And when she smells roses, she's, she cries. So how the hell you can relate it? Okay, this is, let's say, roses is a pleasant smell. And you say, wow, nice smell, but somebody could cry. And on, on the sulfur smell, well, we, we said that it's rotten exactly. We don't like it. So in our DNA, uh, since the microorganisms is the living form, this, the first sense of smell created was the sense of smell. So the microorganism learned to say, good smell is food, bad smell is poison. So in our brain setup, we don't have in between, is good or bad. When we smell something, we don't have a middle point. It's good smell. The middle point, sometimes Chinese, when they say, oh, I don't know this smell, but just cautiously, you reject the smell and says, no, I don't like it. Yeah, very good answer, good or bad. I've never seen someone who likes uh, H, uh, H2O <laughs> smell. But, uh, <laughs> in this case, I would say there is uh, uh, no big differentiation. So, have you another question? <clears throat> yeah. How, again for you, Rodolfo, how to measure the extent of smell in your work? Good and bad is one thing, but the extent is something else. Well, well that is the hedonic tone. You know, smell like fish, smell like uh, rotten, because most of this leather smell test, mostly they measure the intensity. But then you have to say at what smell. And in, in, in Volkswagen, okay, it could smell some like uh, ink or like phenolic, but in Volkswagen, they don't measure the intensity, how, how much phenolic it is or not. It's just they wrote down. So the extension is the tonic tone, and the intensity. So uh, uh, in the test as well, also to stress and to release more volatiles, some of the tests, they put it water inside, humidity. So, but uh, let's say that the smell tests are measured by intensity and of course the tonic tone. And uh, in, if you would like to correlate the smell that never much, and you know, Dietrich, this is that if you have low emissions, piece of leather doesn't mean that doesn't smell. You need one molecule and then you get the, the you don't pass the smell. But okay, answering the word, the, the, the question, intensity and hedonic tone. This is our more the, 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 the two way of measure the smell. Rodolfo, is it is it always done by human subjects? Is that still the most efficient way of doing it? Because you hear people talk about electronic noses and sensors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. is, is, is the extent of smell, is it purely subjective? Uh, yes, yes, because uh, I remember uh, uh, in a big, big automotive tannery, we, we ran a trial, 200 heights, 200 heights, same recipe, same origin, same formulation for an American company that works in, operates in China and the States for the same model, 100 heights went to the USA, 100 heights went to the China, same company, same mm -hmm. methods. In the USA, the smell pass, in China, doesn't. So, no, 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 no way to, to, to you, you need to change the brain of the Chinese, no chance. <laughs> it's cultural. Okay. No. Oh, yeah. no, we don't want to change brains. <laughs> But it's what you said, uh, Christine, it's very uh, subjective. No? And therefore, these are very trained people at this, pe uh, uh, which are doing this. And then the intention actually they are giving on a subjective, yeah, um, and, and they grade it between one and five or one and 10, what Louis said to him. Thank you very much for your work and presentation. Is it necessary to design a product that quantitatively detects or intuitively responds to gas on the leather surface when the car leaves the factory? Okay, I will try to answer this question, but uh, uh, 
let's say electronic knows all the machines that they try to detect smell never correlates with the final evaluation at, the, uh, at each person. Uh, so many car interiors, uh, they uh, develop devices in the filter system, in the air conditioning, just to absorb some of the volatiles there. And I don't know if this is uh, the right answer to this question. Uh, so the answer from Van Yang would be simple, no, right? No. Mm, yes. yeah. no, 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 it is quite difficult, but okay, the concept, the, the how you say the background, wh what he wants to ask, it is how can we avoid these smells, but to detect, there are now uh, companies that they develop a uh, type of uh, the closest device to the sense of smell. It is now done by a company uh, that they created uh, in a chip, they put protein. And these proteins react under different volatiles. And with these different volatiles, uh, with a special light, the protein uh, changed the color and they could more or less re replicate uh, the signals of our olfactory sense. And they are looking or trying to search if the type of smell could be accepted in China or in another countries. Doesn't mean if it is too high or too low, why this Chinese could uh, detect it as a pleasant and why the, the same smell in Europe not and vice versa. So there are some devices, but still not uh, established in the market already. Thanks. Another question? No. Yeah. Mm. That is the question to a chemical company. Is there a product which can reduce the smell? No. No. Let's say uh, there are products, of course, that could avoid some of the sources of the smell. Yes. Let's say uh, when in the fat liquid in part, uh, because oxidation, of course, uh, fat liquids, good fat liquids, they are at antioxidants. But these antioxidants has also a time frame uh, effectiveness. So after time, the antioxidant is already used and then you will get it. But uh, one product that cover or mask or scavenge all the smells, impossible. So the, the approach has to be in the in other way. And we are working on it, but still not having a, a final conclusion. But one product, no chance. Yes. That is um, what we also always found out. Mm -hmm. So, a question to our colleague from Kenya. What are the best methods small and medium enterprises can use in order to adopt soft technologies in the leather sector in Kenya? Are you still there? Mr. Ondjancha. Mm, maybe he's not uh, um, there anymore or he's on mute, I don't know. One of the methods uh, Christine has already mentioned, go to the webpage of IOLTCS. One soft method was training and uh, then you can get a lot of uh, help and support to organize a training even in a small company and also by the way of the unido homepage, uh, you also find a lot of uh, um, good uh, training modules Ah, Christine, that's a question from you. <laughs> yes, sorry, because <laughs> I didn't want to keep us into the conversation. So I just needed Rodolfo back. Um, no. 
Yeah, it just occurred to me because obviously the study has all been on based on the Chinese reaction to the leather. Um, but does that extend to all materials? Because obviously there are lots of vehicles, as we know, and as we are up against at the moment, where they are putting other synthetic materials in, whereas traditionally we would like them to have leather. Um, so do those complaints extend to those those materials too, or is it just very specific to leather? Uh, if uh... If I have to answer correctly, yes, synthetics in China or vinyl smell are mm -hmm. pleasant for Chinese. Right. Not leather. Uh, and I, I have to go back also my own experience. I remember my mother when I uh, uh, put this uh, plastic foil on the books of my school, it was a very strong, smelly, uh, mm. plastic-like. And... And when I smell this uh, plastic uh, foil, it remembers me back to the school as a great moment. Yeah. I, 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 I don't reject it. But of course, when you jump into the car, uh, you must think, I would like to smell such synthetic smelly interior or yes or no. And definitely uh, Chinese, they grew up with plastic around, not with leather around. So in our culture, uh, we were more related that leather, we smelled our jacket, the jacket of our grandfather, or the shoe of our father, or the belt, or the, 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 the so we, we, we associate leather smell with something from luxury item, but also familiar and Chinese uh, normally know. So synthetic materials, mostly in, in China, I would say, are accepted. Accepted. It's, it's very complex, isn't it? The whole thing of the emotion that's yeah. linked, as yeah. we were saying about the lady with the roses, it, yeah. it's very deep-seated and probably, yeah, there's no logic, but it's yeah. just, as you say, what you've been exposed to from a very young a very young age. Mm -hmm. No, mm -hmm. okay, because I say sorry. for us... Sorry, then sorry. I take, my, then I take back my remark that we will not change genetics. <laughs> <laughs> It's not possible. It's not possible. Really. Start doing genetic modification of people so they buy leather more. <laughs> okay. No it's chance. Probably not, no. probably not very ethical. <laughs> so that's why I, I mentioned that the leather arrived to stay. Leather smell problem arrived to stay. That is, is there. Yeah. 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 Then um, that was the final question. Excuse me. Um, and we can come to an end of the last session. Uh, maybe that's the right word, moment to find some, some general words also. It was a first hybrid conference, a complete new format. And um, I have to say, uh, we had some IT hiccups in the beginning also, but the vast majority of presentations and discussions went well. And I've seen, I've seen, I have to say the great, the great job of the IT. We can give them an applause. Mm -hmm. Maybe the camera can go to the IT people here who had a very good job in the last I agree reading. because it's, it's been a real challenge. I mean, it's the first time it's been done. And, and I actually think it's a great model for the future because so many more people can attend. I know the time zone is always a different dif difficulty, but the fact so many people can attend remotely, not everybody can travel the world easily. And so I think for future, we should seriously look at doing um, you know, a live event, but this hybrid model. Um, so maybe China will have to take that on board for their next Congress. Yeah, and also a big thank to all these remote listeners around the world. I mean, we had between 90 and 110 people always online, yeah, always. you know, yeah. uh, sometimes at two o'clock in the morning or whatever. And uh, um, this patients, when some hiccups were there, so um, they didn't um, leave the meeting. So thank you very much to everyone. And I hope everyone found some interesting new ideas out of all these informative presentations. Mm -hmm. What I very much liked is was the widespread. Very often we have in this conference a lot of beam house or tanning or retanning talks. We also had a lot of um, <coughs> finishing talks and very, very interesting other items like upcycling and what we just heard of smell. So thanks to everyone. And then oh, but Dietrich, can I also add in, it's the first time I've been to a Congress where we've done exercises and I thoroughly enjoyed that. Um, 
I think uh, in Dresden, we had a Congress where one of the presenters was taking leather from gymnasiums and upcycling into leather goods. Well, we've gone a step further now and actually doing physical exercise um, and energizing. I think that was great fun. Yeah. Um, now I just got um, informed that there are two other questions or three other questions. Um, to Ms. Xu, nice presentation. What kind of structure in the linkage is formed between zinc oxide and uh, casein? How did you ensure or determine the linkage between zinc oxide and P and casein and the nanocomposite beyond FTIR? So we still have five minutes. So I think it's uh, fair that we have these questions as well. Ms. Xu, are you still online? I hear something. No, she looks like she's not. Um, To Mr. Abdissa, again, thanks for the presentation. Have you purified the amylase? And have you evaluated its protease activity before using it open fiber? Okay, thank Mr. you. Mr. Abdissa, are you there? Yes, thank you. Ah, yes, hey, uh, sorry, yeah. Okay, thank you. Before applying the, uh, the enzyme on the laser processing, the enzyme which have a highest activity was taken uh, for the laser processing and uh, purification process namely micro and ultra uh, ultra filtration was carried out to concentrate the enzyme uh, two times thank you this answers this question do we have one more Dietrich, we have got miss miss Xu. She is, is, is online. She's just answered me, so she can answer her questions. Ah, okay. So can you, uh, hopefully you also can see the question, then please, Ms. Uh, Xu, um, give your comment. We don't hear anything. Are you on mute, possibly? No, sorry. Then it doesn't work. Oh, you cannot hear me. Uh, no, she. Um, no, we can't hear you. She's asking yeah. me if we can hear her. Yeah. Uh, then she should give an answer no. by, by I, mail. Yes. Unfortunately, I can't. We can't hear. Have you? You're not on mute. You checked that your microphone is on. She can hear us, but we can't hear her. Unless the IT department can do something quickly. So, another no, sorry, question. No, so, sorry, sorry, Ms. Shu. It's um, um, we need the IT to help. Let me just send a message to. Again, Ms. Xu or Shu, can you talk? Is there? Ah, okay. Come, and then I would say um, we'll do this by mail. Yeah, Mr. Um, or Ms. Yahanu, uh, 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 please contact her and um, by email, and um, then I'm sure you get a good question. Yeah, then we are through. Thank you very much, everyone. And um, we meet again for the closing ceremony at 2.35 our time.
Professor McConnell, yes? Yes, uh, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, really, this uh, last session, although we had stayed long, but uh, it was very interactive and very interesting. Active participation, we are grateful to our moderators, uh, Dr. Christine, Dr. Dietrich, all our participants. I think uh, they will also show us the certificates. Uh, uh, let us see those certificates of presenters. And I would really like to ask that um, the big auditorium is also listening to the closing ceremony, even if there are no lectures. Mr. Chen from China will present the new, uh, um, yeah, the next IULTCS Congress, and we have to pass on the flag to him. Thank you. The certificates are now being displayed. Yeah, thank you very much. In fact, uh, the organizing committee will have uh, greatly recognition certificates to all our scientific committee reviewers, to all our moderators, to all our presenters, to all our participants, to all our sponsors, and uh, to all our partners also. It will be sent through your uh, individual uh, contacts. Uh, we are very thankful. Uh, we will break for lunch. Uh, obviously, after lunch, there will be a big official closing. All of you return back after lunch. <laughs>